Hey everybody, welcome back to Yorkshire Fab Shop. Today we're going to be doing another exciting instalment of the My Little Restoration series in which we look to repair a tool that probably should have just been thrown away. In this episode we are looking at a bandsaw because it's one of those tools that you kind of can't live without once you have used or have had experience of. I've not got one in my workshop and I've been dying to get one for a while so this is the perfect project that we can kind of bring up to some reasonable standard and then put straight to work. So let's dive straight into it and have a look at what we've managed to salvage. So here it is in all its glory and I'm sure you'll all agree in pretty shocking condition as well. I'm sure many recognise this as one of those generic four and a half inch bandsaws. They were available in many manufacturers and many different colours, this one being a draper and in blue. The main problems and issues with this are associated with an incident that happened during some point in its life where it's evidently suffered a bit of a fall. So it's been dropped out of a van or onto a workshop floor or something because there's lots of broken items that we need to fix. First and foremost is on the back there is a cast arm that usually has a spring attached and manages the weight of the assembly when you're lowering it down to work. That's clean broken off and is obviously part of the fall damage. Next is the motor tensioner plate and it's still got motor foot attached so this motor has only got three feet. Speaking of the motor, cover's been smashed off and then finally this cover, although complete, looks like it's been dragged down the road. So, you, why did I go out and buy this? Well, first and foremost, I didn't realise it was in this poor condition before I bought it. But it was so cheap, I couldn't not. So it came with five new blades, and I couldn't buy those for the price of everything. Secondly, this motor, although it has only got three feet, does work, works well. And it is a one horsepower, four pole, single phase. So it's a really useful motor if I ever want to use it for anything else. Another great thing is this gearbox is solid, complete, works well because this is a really weak point on these saws. They like to strip the gears in there and obviously it's a write-off then. Next, everything does work. The bearing blocks are okay. The adjustment works, the vice works. And the belt tension works and belt stays on pulleys. So underneath all this grime and damage, there is a usable bandsaw that we are going to try and bring back to life and put back into use. So main fixes for this are going to be, first and foremost, the motor plate. We're going to manufacture a new one so we can remount the motor. Next, we're not going to fix the arm behind. We're going to fit some form of drop control. That will make this a really versatile saw and mean we'll be able to cut quite thick sections, hopefully. And then thirdly, we're going to try and add some sort of coolant reservoir so we can prolong the life of the blade. So with all that in mind, let's dive straight into manufacturing a new plate and let's get the motor remounted. It did also come with a stand, which is probably the worst thing I've ever seen and I doubt I'll be using it. But I've got it, so we'll see. It does want some strengthening, some modification if I'm going to carry on using it. But I suspect this saw is going to probably live on my bench most of the time, so I won't need that because I've not really got the floor space to keep it.
So with the motor mounted, we can now prove that the bandsaw functions well. You'll notice that the belt guard's not fitted, that's because it doesn't fit. And I suspect that's why it looks in such terrible condition. Try to mount this other motor and it doesn't fit with this belt arrangement. Obviously I've moved the motor position as well now, so I'll have to I'll have to cage that in. I've tried cutting a piece of small box section and it cuts, which is brilliant. The only issue being that these bearing blocks need adjustment because it doesn't cut straight. It cuts fairly straight, but it doesn't cut perfectly straight. It cuts kind of on an angle. And another problem with the saw is Hopefully you could see that, but this pivot position here has got about three quarters of an inch of clearance so the physical position of the saw arm can move. All we'll do to fix that is just make a small bushing, something to take up the gap so it'll stay in one position. So that's a nice and easy fix. So if we throw a bit of material in we'll have a look, see how well it cuts. Of course there's no way of managing the speed of the drop so I'll just do it by hand. And it's not that heavy, it's pretty manageable and you could probably do it without having any drop control, you could probably just do it by hand. Whether you'd want to or not is another question. So we have a look at the piece that we've cut. It's not very level looking from above and the side profile doesn't actually look too bad but hopefully you can see it's kind of tapering in one direction. So we look to rectify the position of the blade try and get that cutting nice and straight. So having just spoken about this pivot point this is the gap here. So we can physically move the saw arm. Obviously that far, so it's probably an inch actually looking at it. Very easy fix, all we'll do is just make an insert that will maintain this arm in that position. Just take up that gap there. Honestly, it's so convenient owning a lathe, you can just knock something like that up in a couple of minutes. That's it, job done. No movement in there now. So with the motor now mounted and the saw somewhat tidy, we've come round to the back because we're going to fit the drop system. So. You'll notice there's a hole there, I've put that there. There's a couple in the top as well because we've got to fit a bracket onto here. This is to act as the support for the drop control system. So what this is, in combination with this fastener down here, we've got a hydraulic drop system. So this is the system then. Like I say, it's hydraulic, although it's hydraulic in the sense that it's full of water as opposed to full of oil because water is a lot cleaner, of course. 
and it was a recycled air actuator which should be perfect for this size and weight of bandsaw. So if it's on the saw using that little fastener there And then it'll easily retain the weight of the arm because it's not too heavy, especially with the counterbalance of the motor. So we have our little flow control in which we can open this and then it'll commence the coming down of the arm. So although that's quicker than we'd want, these fittings I've actually got flow control in them so I can fine tune those as well to slow it down or speed it up depending on what we're cutting. Like I say we'll go through that in a separate video but that's nice and easy to fit just a bracket on there, bracket on there and we're good to go. And then it's just a case of lifting up and then it'll be away again until we close the valve and then it'll stop. Just to quickly demonstrate the control that we've got now on this drop this is set to almost the lowest I can say at but you'll notice that it is dropping very slowly and this would probably be suitable for some solid materials or definitely some thicker box section so small pieces of maybe inch bar or three four inch box section probably would be suitable but that's that's the control that we've got now with this it's a great addition and I think it's going to make this a really versatile saw. Now that the saw is working well and the drop control functions correctly, we can look to give the saw a basic service and then we can set the blade. I'll we'll start by looking at the gearbox and seeing what condition that's in. I already know that this is okay, but it still wants some fresh oil. So things that we're looking for then is there's a rubber gasket, a rubber joint on the inside of this plate. We're looking at that's complete and it's not leaking. I know this isn't leaking because I haven't seen any oil running out of it. But that's not to say once it gets warm it doesn't start. Although it does look in okay condition and we'll reuse that. So the gears themselves again look okay. There's a bit of a poor wear pattern on this and due to not being set up correctly you, you would never you would never get a perfect wear pattern on there because the factory that produces these is just simply not going to check so we could we could change that but it's not really going to be worth us time and effort to be honest main thing is there's no great lumps missing the engagement between these two gears is okay and although minor there are a few flecks of metal brass, bronze, whatever that gears in this oil to be expected again. I don't know how much this has been used so I can't accurately say whether there's the right amount or not. However the gears themselves again look fine. Engagement is okay. We can see when we turn the pulleys oil is being drawn in and it is being dragged onto the onto the mating surfaces. So that's fine. That's all working well. So we'll quickly suck that oil out and get some fresh in and should be good for another few years. So the oil of choice then is, is just an ISO 150 machine oil, which is perfect choice for this application. One thing you do need to check with your oils is that if you're using them with brass bronze gears that, that it's compatible with those because there's quite a lot of oils that aren't and they do eat away at the yellow metals. So all we're going to do is just top this gearbox up so that the level is just below 
the edge of the casing. So that'll be good now for another couple of years. And we can see it's getting drawn onto the onto the gears perfectly. Once that's flying round, oil will be everywhere in there. So the next thing to talk about then is down here, and it's these two supports or bearing blocks or blade guides, whatever you want to call them. So the main purpose of these obviously is to add support to the blade, but they do another job and that's twisting the blade into the correct cutting orientation because if these weren't here, because the pulleys are on an uh, angle in relation to where the material is, the blade would be in the same orientation as the saw arm and obviously that's no good for cutting materials in this orientation so these physically twist the blade and direct it into this kind of horizontal orientation problem with these is it's very easy to set these up incorrectly and that will give us either an off like a, an angled cut or it'll bevel the material and the aim of this is to try and get this so it produces a nice straight cut so there's quite a lot of adjustability on these and not only can you adjust the angle of the blade by twisting these blocks, you can also set the blade tension and obviously you can set the position. So we can have this basically wherever we want within reason. Now the only issue I've spotted with this is for whatever reason the underneath of this support catches on this. So if this is any further in than this area it stops on there as opposed to stopping on the machine stop which is a shame so I don't know whether I might grind a little bit of material for the bottom of those we'll have to see but if we take one of these off we'll be able to see everything that it does to get these working properly then they do need a little bit of love so if we start by loosening this off this will show us the adjustment that we've got access to so it will twist which will help align the blade to the correct cutting angle but it also moves up and down as well so that will set the physical height of the blade and this this can introduce problems if it's too high then won't, well, there won't be enough blade support on this center bearing and the blade will want to lift up and that could damage the pulleys and if it's too low then we can have issues where the blade jumps off the pulleys because it's been supported in the wrong position. So it's quite important that we have that set at the right height. And you'll be able to gauge that by simply by eye or making sure that when it's running, you set that just low enough so that that starts to take up a little bit of the weight of the blade. Not too much. You want to allow that to slip slightly because when it's under load on the material, then that'll start working. I brought you in a little bit closer now to have a look at these bearings. The nice thing is these are fully sealed bearings so you'd hope that there isn't going to be any metal filings or anything getting inside there and these, these both work okay. There's no issues with those. Same with the centre bearing that you can't quite see. That spins freely as well. But what is important to note on these is these can be set to manage the blade support what I mean by that is these two pins are cams so the gap in between the bearings can be set to whatever it is that you want so if I get my 12 mil spanner on the inside of here we can turn this and you can see that the gap in between the two bearings changes so they're both they're both touching now and rotate 180 degrees and we've got a small gap in there now so what I like to do when I'm setting these is I like to set it with the blade width and then plus a couple of thou because if this is too tight and the blade heats up then it's going to put excessive stress on in, on these bearings and this bearing block and although we're only talking a couple of thou so it's not the end of the world 
it could result in blade getting trapped or damaging the bearings or damaging the blade or even the blade jumping out of its location and coming off the pulleys. So tension is quite critical on that, it doesn't want to be nipping the blade, it just wants to be slightly clear. And the way that we can do that is by getting a blade, shoving it in the gap and then getting a little failure gauge and, and just gapping the clearance in there. So I use about three thou. Don't want to be too much more than that because otherwise the support won't be adequate. Just be aware that if you do change blade, the blade thickness can change. So that'll need resetting. So back over to the saw then, I've got this propped up so I can set the blade. The first thing I want to do is set the angle of the blade. I've got my trusty square, I'll drop that onto the bed and then by looking down from above we can set the correct angle. So we'll set it at this end because that's adjusting that one and then we'll set it at that end because obviously we need to adjust that one as well. So that's roughly set now, I'm happy with that. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to set this fixed jaw because I can see it's a mile off. So it'll be a similar process again, but we'll actually use the blade instead. Because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that we're worried about, that that cuts square in relation to the jaw. So there is a bit of runoff. as can be seen there. So we'll bring the back edge of that jar in. Yeah, that's pretty good now. So that should cut a lot squarer than it did before. Like I was saying earlier, I'm having to run this a bit further away than I would like to because these bearings or the pin underneath contacts this bed plate. And that's a problem because the blade won't drop all the way through otherwise. So what we'll do is we'll just run that beyond there. We'll have to see how the blade goes because it might might want to move about a little bit more on the smaller stuff. Hopefully it shouldn't be too much of a problem. So the last thing to sort, although you maybe should have done this a little bit earlier than this, is to sort the tension. Now I'm happy with the tension on this saw, but without a proper blade tensioning tool, it'll be difficult to quantify how much tension is enough tension. Now there is some general guidance on the old internet and it does suggest that if you go underneath here and you gently squeeze the blade it shouldn't be so easy to get the blade to touch the edge of the casing. That's about 10 millimeters. So with very, with very little effort if you can force the blade onto the edge of the casing then it's too slack and it wants to be tighter. But if it is too slack then you'll get this jumping off or it'll slip when you're cutting. So I would always start with kind of a good medium weight on there. You don't really want to be putting too much effort into tightening that because it'll cause you further issues down the line. Like the blade will be really likely to jump off the pulleys or you could damage the pulleys or damage the blade. So advice is always to give that a good pull. Do the test on the, on the inside of the saw. Make sure it's not too easy for the blade to touch the edge of the casing and then run it on something small you'll very easily be able to identify whether the blade tension is not enough or too much so with everything complete now the last test is to use everything in conjunction with everything else that we've done today so we've got our drop system on those bearing blocks are set and ready to go so all that's left to do is turn this on and see if it cuts
I don't know about you, but I'd say I'm pretty happy with that. That's looking a lot squarer than that one that we did earlier. Down from above and on the sides as well. That's pretty even, that, actually. Yeah, quite happy with that. Three, then. All in all, I'm pretty chuffed, actually, with the way it's turned out. I didn't expect it to be as capable as it is. I've yet to try the really big stuff on here, but I'm sure with this new drop system that I've installed and the fact that everything's trued up now I don't think you'll have too much difficulty with the thicker box section and the bigger sections I'll probably throw something that's maybe an inch inch and a half square in or something solid first just to try it but to do that I'll need to add the lubrication system which I haven't done yet although it is just going to be a bottle with a pipe that drops coolant onto the blade Nothing really exciting about that, so I didn't think it were worthwhile showing that. I also need to put a catch tray in somewhere so that I can collect it, so that I don't have coolant running everywhere, because that's the big problem. Other little minor tasks that need doing is this belt guard needs installing. But again, didn't think you were really bothered about seeing that. I hope you found the setting up of the blade useful as well, because I know there's many a bandsaw that aren't set up correctly. And you're probably scratching your head thinking, why the hell isn't it cutting square? On that note, I hope you've enjoyed this little build and recommissioning of this pretty much ready for the skip bandsaw. I'm happy to have one in the workshop now because I've been needing one for quite a long time. So thanks for watching everybody. See you next time.